Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Meepleville Meets. Today, we have with us all the way from Wisconsin, we have Jeremy Howard from Ma'am versus Meeple. Hello, Jeremy. Hey, party people. How y'all doing, man? Hey, you doing, Tim? I'm nice doing just here. fine. Thank Glad you. Glad to be here. Yes, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So uh, real quick, if you don't mind, uh, for everybody watching, in case they're not familiar with you, just do me a favor, introduce yourself, and let people know how they may recognize you, or if they don't know you, what you do. Uh, my name is Jeremy Howard. Um, I am with Man vs. Meeple. Formerly, um, I was by myself as uh, Jim Malai plays games, if you recognize that. But I'm also kind of more known for two things. Uh, one is Solo Sundays, which is most of my content is solo-based. Um, or you may have heard me on many podcasts or live shows, but I also refer to myself as a community builder. Um, I like to be part of the board game community, and if you're around on Facebook and different parts where there's um, community-driven things, um, usually I'm that person that shares that kind of stuff. So that's probably where you recognize me the most. All right, very good. So uh, what I'd like to first start with is uh, talk about your involvement with Man versus Meeple. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, what exactly do you do for them? Because as you said, you uh, are primarily solo game focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, why why that particular genre of uh, of playing solo games? Um, well, uh, with Man vs. Meeple, my role is pretty much to cover everything if I can. But I, I cover, I do like their Kickstarter previews because that's what I was doing beforehand. And I also do the Solo Sunday specifically. That's kind of like my own content. And then I also contribute to Chit Chat, which is their biggest thing as well. Uh, but I do solo play because it was something that I connected with. It's something that um, I do. It's a good chunk of my gaming. It's not all of it, but it's something that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I like to kind of spread that around. It also gives me the opportunity to talk about games that have multiplayer and solo um, because I try to I tend to buy games that are like that. So I want people to know that, like, hey, you know, there's a solo mode in this game, and it's really good. Um, or it may be a good game to play solo on its own, and the perk is that it's multiplayer, kind of back and forth. Uh, but, yeah, I just like that kind of gameplay. Um, and if it's done right, it's done right. If it's not done right, I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let <laughs> That's you know. absolutely true. And yeah. how long have you been with Man vs. Meeple now? Uh, this is uh, we're, we're approaching year number two, year one year. Nice. So how did you get involved with uh, Jeremy and, and Man vs. Meeple? Another uh, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of it's, it's kind of a long story, but uh, basically I met them back when I was actually just about to start film filming because I had a site called jambalayaplaysgames.com. Uh, may it rest in peace. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> lost the thing for it, so now it's gone. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, they met me back when I was first starting to film stuff on my actual camera. <laughs> so uh, I was filming on my camera, and then I met Jeremy. And he like watched me interview somebody. I think he watched me interview Zev from uh, WizKids. And he was just like, man, you really handle yourself well. And I was like, man, I'm, I got confidence for days. I can handle myself well on camera. I'm good. But uh, we ended up talking two years later because of Kira. Uh, Kira Peebly is a person that's kind of a hub uh, for communications, marketing, and stuff like that um, in the board game industry. And she had been working with me since I had a blog, like way back when I had like 15, 20 readers a day. <laughs> Uh, and uh, because of that, I kind of stayed with her and uh, I trusted her a lot. And she had a, she put a lot of confidence in me when she was with Colossal. And uh, when I left uh, Board Game Revolution, I was with Board Game Re Revolution as a content creator there. And uh, I was leaving and she said, you're kind of a free agent and I have multiple places to choose from. And I want to attach to a channel. And I was like, I just want to attach to somebody. I'm fine with that. And uh, out of the other ones, the big ones, I chose them. So there you go. All right. Very good. So um, I just want to make sure that we're not missing anything here because I heard as you talked up, you, you, you mentioned Board Game Revolution, and then you had your own thing, the Jambalaya Plays Games. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just so we don't miss anything, no. um, let's kind of yeah. let's, let's kind of go all the way back to the beginning. Okay. And, uh, let's first out find out how did you end up in Wisconsin? Are you from there or did you yeah. live there? Yeah, I was born and raised here um, mm -hmm. in Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, it's a sort of great city to be raised in earlier on, but now it's not. <laughs> it ain't, it ain't. I was contemplating moving away. Um, oh. Actually, some certain things turned out a certain way. I would actually, I told my wife, we had like a detonation bomb. We're moving in three years. Oh, except <laughs> from that day. Except from that day. And I was not playing. She was like, man, you are really like, this is not alcohol talking. This is you. Uh -huh. I was like, hey. Three years. Once we know what's up, three years, we out of here. 
We're saving uh-huh. all our money, all our money. No extra, no extra candy, no extra honey buns, no nothing. We out of here. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, I love it. I was born and raised here. Um, I went, went to the military and I've lived a lot of places. Uh, after I even got out of the military, I came back home and then I went and I was a teacher for a while. So I traveled doing that. And I was about to leave to Abu Dhabi and teach. <laughs> so oh, wow. uh, I decided to stay and I, I came back home and I, well, I, I took my wife. My now wife took me back for like the fourth time and I married her and I stayed <laughs> home, you know. So, all right. Well, yeah. first of all, uh, thank you for your yeah. service. You were in the yeah. military. What uh, branch were you in and what did you do in the military? I was uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, I was only in the Marine Corps for like two years. I got hurt uh, pretty bad at my, my, like my year and a half mark. And I just couldn't get better. And I was starting to be a little whiny kid, you know, whiny young guy. And I, I kind of, I probably talked my way into going home, basically. Um, but yeah, I was in the Marine Corps, Lance Corporal. And uh, I was a, in supply. I was going to be an accountant and uh, I was going to do accounting work. And I ended up being a supply at administration, which is really, to me, honestly, it was just counting stuff. To, and that's at the end of the day, when I think about it, I was like, this is just counting stuff. I mean, I did ordering of parts and stuff for tanks and helicopters. And then I did, uh, you know, like our, all our gear. So we had all our gear, um, everything except for weapons. I was the person that had to distribute. I was part of the distribution of that kind of stuff. A lot of these things are admin, but in the Marine Corps, everybody's a soldier. So if anything happens, <laughs> like if anything goes down, the base will shut down and we all are going. So that's right. Yeah. Like we the first to go. <laughs> like, you- the first to go. So. Yeah, and you still, had to go through, you still had to yeah. go through uh, basic training at Paris Island, right? Did you go there? Yeah, I, no. So I went, I'm a Hollywood Marine. So I went to uh, uh, Camp Lejeune. I'm oh, no, okay. sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. San Diego, MCRD San Diego. Uh, that was interesting. I got hurt in the middle of that boot camp. So I was there not only three months, I was there for six months. Yeah. Okay. So I was in boot camp for a long time. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of great stories from that because I almost went through everything twice. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot about myself in that boot camp. Um, I had to do a lot of reflection, uh, oh. a lot, a lot of personal reflection. I got, um, I had some anger management problems. Now, people who are hearing this are like, "Really, dude? <laughs> Whoa!" <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had some big anger management problems. It almost got me kicked out, and uh-huh. uh, due to a great, great chaplain who sat down with me, um, and I had to have mandatory anger management or whatnot. Uh, it really, really helped me learn how to deal with anger. Um, and controlling my anger and my fear, which is a big thing. You know, your fear will, will cause this in you to kind of like make right. you roused up, you know, and react to some some things that are not even in those other person's control. It's like you're reacting to them and you're like making and blaming them for it. And I used to blame people for things. And that take personal responsibility? Right, 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 right. So I would do that. Or, you know, I didn't get in my way and I was the only child. Um, or I was just kind of backed in a corner. So the only way when I felt like I was backed in a corner, which I wasn't backed in a corner just yet, I would just attack anything in front of me. So, you well, know. Yeah, the military, yeah. Uh, you cannot think of a better place to learn that it's not about you, right? <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, is that, you know, like I, I, the thing, what, what it was is that like I was away from home for really the first, first time as far as like not being able to come back right away. Uh-huh. I, tra- I had traveled a lot, like back and forth to my, my grands, grandma and all over the place. But like this was like different because I was in a spot where I always followed orders. Like I always you didn't have to like it wasn't hard for me to like stand up and do push ups. Like I just follow orders. I'm that I'm a very respectful person. But I was starting to be around people who weren't used to that. <laughs> like and they were like it was like it was almost like being gizmo around a whole bunch of gremlins at first. Uh-huh. To me, like to me, like it was like out of body. I'm like, why are people like yelling and they can't understand stuff? And then like they put me as a squad leader. And it, and, and since I was like the cookie cutter to them because I, I listened, uh-huh. like people would, you know, kind of pick on me or they would, they wanted to be squad leader. Why did you choose? Why did they choose you? And da 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 da, you know. So it kind of festered all these, you know, back and forth, very, you know, just, it just gets you riled up. You know, I'm not even a fighter. And we were just going at it. Like, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you know, Marines, hey, man, hey, hey, we, we, we talk, but we talk in a lot of ways. Uh-huh. <laughs> we talk in a lot of ways. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, we talk in a lot of ways. So, yeah, it, just, so- it was just different. It was a different time and, and it helped me out a lot. That experience, the biggest thing I can say is that that was the thing I learned that. And I learned, like, you know, how to trust, you know, um, trust other people. Oh, and, yeah. you know, from yeah. all, all backgrounds. You know, all backgrounds. I had someone who I knew was really close to me. He was gay, and I had never dealt with that before. Mm-hmm. You know, I had never dealt with that before. So it was like I learned that. Uh, you know, I learned how to you know just 
understanding people's lives and backgrounds more than mine and not taking their perspective. Um, it just, man, it, it like it, and that made me different. The, the man you see before you today is the reason why I like that. I don't, you know, I, I don't usually, I, I know how to distribute my anger somewhere else and not at That's people, good. That's you know, good. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, I just, you know, yeah. So, okay. So then what, that had to be a pretty big life change, right? I mean, so here you are, you went into the military, you decided that's what you were going to do, especially yeah. the Marines, that's hardcore there. You were only there for about a year and a half, like you said, or whatever you got yeah. injured. So coming out, having to like sort of reevaluate your life or mm -hmm. where you were going to go from there had to be like a pretty major turning point in your life. So where did you decide to go from there? Yeah. So I came back home, you know, I was, my tail was tucked and I wasn't necessarily that much better when I came home. I was like in a wrong mental state. Um, and I struggle with like depression. I call it, we call it failure to adjust when you go, go into the military. Cause some people like lose their minds. They'll in the first four days, I think you can go back home. You start confessing to stuff. People confess they're doing drugs and all that stuff like that. So you can go back. Or if you got pregnant, you can actually find out you got pregnant. You got there, you can go back. Well, we, I call it fa failure to adjust when you go home because some people can't adjust to going back home as well. So I'm assuming that combat veterans feel something similar where they can't adjust to go back home. And I felt that way because I had been already trained in the military mindset. I had been on base. I had been working with my brothers every day. I mean, we went to bars and we, we fought with each other. We, you know, we did all these things together uh, against other, you know, like we knew that we were together no matter what, you trust everybody with everything. And then you go home and you, you're away from that. And uh, you're away from it and you don't know what it's like to be around people. You don't necessarily know if you can trust them yet. And uh, I mean, like, you know, I'd rather I would go to the mall, hang out and look at, you know, go chase the girls and whatnot. But like, I didn't want to be around my friends. You know, they, they, to me, they were civilians and I wasn't ready to be with civilians yet. I was ready. To, I was you know, ready to chill my brothers. You know, like we go where we go. Right. You right. know, we go, where we go, you know. And uh, and then I just kind of became a loner for a while. And I realized like that I hadn't. That's when it, I found out I had mental illness. Like I had a mental illness going oh, really? on. Yeah, and it wasn't just temporary depression. So I had to deal with that kind of stuff too. I wasn't ready for it. Okay. Um, I wasn't ready for it. I resisted it. And uh, yeah, I learned. I mean, years later, I learned that about me. I had to embrace that. Thank God for my wife, you know, which was my girlfriend at the time, and she even brought it up, you know. But I, I'm glad that I did that. I'm glad I took that journey as well. It may hurt a few, few people along the way and myself, but uh, I yeah, guess so we're yeah, so if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about that a little bit because I have talked to other guests about that. And uh, unfortunately, here in America, with our you know healthcare issue and all that they're doing, yeah. a lot of times mental health gets disregarded or pushed by the side or yeah. not even brought up in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what were you either diagnosed with or what did you realize you had and how did you maybe uh, start dealing with it? Yeah. So um, I was and I'll, I'll say this ahead of time, like not only this, but like in the black community, it's pretty much like no, 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 uh, no, nothing. Like nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, you know, people will drink it away. People will smoke it away. You know, people you know die, you know, and people will never know suicide, things like that. You know, I think I lost my I know I lost my grandpa to something. He, I think he just popped himself off because he just couldn't handle things. His pride. But I also think it was depression. I lost my aunt. She, um, I can't remember. She was a paranoid schizophrenic. She, you know, walked into the middle of the street and killed herself. You know, so I know that there's mental illness in our family, and I, I, I'm bipolar. So I'm, I'm mild bipolar and manic depressive. So I had crazy spells where I was doing all kinds of stuff. We're not going to even go get into all that, but it was absolutely insane. Right. I mean, it was absolutely insane. You know, um, and it's something that I have to deal with today because those manic things can lead to a lot of stuff like. Purchasing oh, a lot of Kickstarters, you know, or, you know, it used to be gambling. It used to be women, like a lot of women, a lot of women, as many women as I can handle, you know, like anything, drinking, all kinds of stuff. I was out of control. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I had someone there that kind of helped me to address it. And, you know, over time we got to the point where I, I started getting regular medication. I've been, I've been medicated for over 10 years, but there was just a time where I wasn't like, I was not. Well, that's fantastic. You know, but like, like you said, it's yeah. not only... And it's not only a thing like like you said in the black community, it's 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 a thing with just everybody in general because definitely, definitely. It, it's it's a big stigma. As soon as somebody says mm -hmm. mental health or I have mental health issues or problems, it's really stigmatized, and mm -hmm. it needs not to be. It needs to be brought out in the open so everybody knows that you have somebody there to help you right. deal with this stuff. Situations like this, I always say, like you know, it'll never hit until it hits home. You know, um, even when we deal with like COVID, sometimes I just feel like it never hit till it hits home. And then, you know, and then it gets serious. 
and then when it gets serious, you could have had that knowledge a long time ago, you know, or you could have That's listened. Right. You could have listened and not turned the channel when they was talking about some mental health drug or whatever on a on a you know a show. But it's like you got to understand there's a perspective from other people you're dealing with. I'm not saying change you know change the earth for somebody who is having a mental health issue because you may not know if they're just being a you know mean person or mean spirit or they're just like not doing their work just because you know <laughs> like just because they're a lazy person. It's like there are things that are happening around you, and I'm not saying you should be a psychologist or a psych and just know what's going on with everybody, but you know, you got to consider that stuff. I'm very lucky to have a boss that let me deal with this. Uh, right. Like, yeah, in a situation, and like, I mean, I thank dude for that. He ha he has my trust because of that. Because I I told him that when we had our yearly review, I said, man, you did that for me, and I don't, you know, it's not on paper. And I was just like, loyalty over treason, man, forever. I got you got my <laughs> loyalty over treason. When I say loyalty over treason, everybody know look, I'm loyal as hell, man. So if you you all you you own me a team, you on the team. Like I'm not. Uh -huh. Yeah, I got you. Like, I really got you. You ride for me. I got you. Right. So. But the thing, uh, again, the thing about mental health, especially because I, I look at it, you know, here in America, because that's all I can really talk about yeah. as far as going through school and education. Look how it started with, like, say, sex education, right? Yeah. At first, they didn't even want it in schools. And then all of a right. sudden, it started lowering and lowering and lowering and lowering. Yeah getting to lower grades. So yeah. when younger people in uh, grow up with it, they're more aware of it a lot early. And I just yeah. think the same thing needs to happen with mental health. We need yeah. to make people, people aware about it, be educated about it, and it needs to be um, put out there at a young, early age. So mm -hmm. instead of a young kid thinking there's something wrong with them, why are they different? They can maybe yeah. know that they can go get help somewhere. Yeah, I think, uh, man, I, I would say the earlier the better. I remember shout out to Mr. B, you know, when I was a little little kid and don't get me wrong, it was just like my stuff was just like living in the hood and like going to school in these, you know, suburban suburban schools with all these beautiful families and big houses and stuff. And here I am going back to gang territory in the hood, you know. Uh but uh you know, I, I he was there to listen to me, you know, through all that stuff. And uh you know, I had Pam Ryder. I had all these people I could name by names because they were counselors. There was counselors there to talk to me through all these levels. And I'm thinking like, you know, what if these people have body identity issues? What if they have sexual harassment? All these things they don't know how to talk. They don't have anybody to talk to. There's no counselors, you know? There's no counselors along the way. So here this person is, they don't want to maybe confide in even their friends, their parents, you know, like they don't have nowhere to go, you know? Um, and I, you know, I'm lucky because I was the only child. I ain't had nobody to talk to, uh -huh. you know? Like my parents, my mom was a single mom and until she got a little, we got a little bit closer to high school. I didn't have her to talk to because she was at, you know, I worked till nine o'clock, eight, nine o'clock. I came home. I was by myself. Right. You know, so it was like, you know, I had to deal with these things, you know, things I was processing. If I got my butt, I was about to swear. If I was, if I got my butt kicked, I had to lick my head, pick myself up off the floor and drag my butt to the house and just cry in the house. You mm -hmm. know, like, how do you deal with that? Right. Um, but like, yeah, on top of that, you know, mental health is in you. It's not like something that arises. It didn't arise in me. You know, it was in me, you know, right. it's part of who I am. Exactly. So, you know, those are the types of things that I sit with. And I have to look at my son and my son says, Hey, I want to see some counsel. I'm sad. I want to talk to somebody. I'm not going to play around with that, man. You know, like he ain't going to sit on that. Right. You know, right. Dad, I know better. You know? But it's it's good that at least he uh, is open enough to let you know about things like that. Yeah, and again, I, that's why I think with the education and to not make it a bad thing, make it no. Let somebody know and yeah. let these kids know that at an early age when they're very young, please say something to somebody. Yeah, I definitely agree. Know. I had a, I was a teacher uh, for five years, and I mean, like, man, some of the things that I've seen with these kids, man, it's just like. Uh, I could cry about it right now. It's so tough, man. Some some of these kids, it's like, man, they ain't never gonna. The parents ain't never gonna see it, you know. That's right. It's like even if it was for free, they ain't gonna do it. And, yeah. and maybe they can't. They can't do. The, they don't have time. They got to do it like just like my mom. They got three kids. They got to do this and this and this. They got to hustle, you know. They got to hustle day and night, you know. Like people don't understand that. I'm like some people literally have to hustle. That's what they doing, and that's work too. That's hard work. It, it hurts other people. But that's how food is getting on the table and they don't have time to address anybody's needs. They got to get this money to make to, to have anything. Right. You know, like people think it's about being a baller. I'm like, some people just need to have stuff like have anything. So, you know, it's just, you know, I, I know that from you know, where I, you know, I, I know that life. I just know, you know, right. and I tell people like that's why mental health is, is usually a problem in, in like places of poverty. There's, there's a sort of survival over mm -hmm. all this other stuff like. 
that's a luxury. You know what I'm saying? Like that's a luxury. Right. Getting, you know, getting extra loaf of bread is a luxury, you know, <laughs> let alone like addressing your needs, you know, like your specific needs. Uh, right. So it's like you got a long story to tell me. I got stories to tell you about how I pay rent today. Like, you know, like you're sad. You want to know how sad I am? You know, like so that's people, true. It's hard. Again, it's hard to do that, you know. Yeah. And again, that's why I just I, I just think people need to sort of understand that. And I wish more people sort of would approach daily life by that. And what I mean mm-hmm. is you never know what somebody else is going through. Right. So the default should be nice. Right. You should just be nice yeah. to everybody, right? right? Because yeah. you just never know. So, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people, like I try not to react. Even if somebody says something that completely offends me or something that I feel like would ignite any kind of spark in me. And I have to just say to myself, like, what is this? Like, is it worth, what am I about to direct energy towards? Mm-hmm. And, you know, because somebody can be, speaking from complete ignorance and I have to allow them to do that and make it a teachable moment if they allow it, you know, um, because some people will be like, I'm right and you're wrong. And I'm like, all right, if you want to play the right game, you can say you're right, but I'm still going to hit you with this and I'm going to let you sit with it because I want to tell you what's up, you know, like I'm going to tell you what's up and then you can go however you want to do it. That. Like I'm not in the job of making people feel right or wrong or right. I'm just not doing that. Because we're adults and people don't listen to anybody, <laughs> you know. But yeah, uh, yeah but I also I also have to let people show their hand a little bit, you know, and, and let them share their story because sometimes that's where you get to it. You have to be a good listener in order to figure out, you know, you got to maybe ask that question and see where it goes, and then you get to the real part. I had that happen at a tournament. It was at Gen Con, and this guy he had a heart like he was losing, and he thought I had the rules wrong, so he yelled at me. And then there was another guy, he yelled at him because he was losing to him uh-huh. and he didn't want to take the last turn. And I said, hey, man, there's wins and losses in life. you got to take your turn and take the L. And he was like, well, I don't want to lose. I said, well, you, the writing is on the wall and you have to move <laughs> forward. I said, you have to move forward. And if you don't lose, you won't know how to win. Uh-huh. And, and I was like, he may tell you how he won. And you may not even know how he won. So then he loses and he just sat there. He was mad. I mean, he was, I mean, he was red. It was crazy. But I stood there with him. And I let him do that for like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, man, you're all right. You know, da, da, da. we got to talk. And he started sharing all the stuff that he was dealing with and like you know, how he was really looking forward to this experience and, you know, whatever. And I was like, man, let's get a soda. Let's chill and talk. And then we talked and he was just like, you know, I have this problem, these problems and all that stuff. And I was like, he just wanted to be heard, man. And he, right. wanted, he wanted to give out an L. He wasn't ready for the consequence, but more importantly, more importantly, he had some things he wanted to deal with. He had to deal with, and he wanted to be heard. And I think right. he had fun at the rest of Gen Con, and I hope he did have a rest of fun at the rest of Gen Con because of that. Well, that's good, and, that, and that's an interesting point you brought up because uh, speaking about like gaming in general, right mm-hmm. now there are a lot of reasons that people play games or yeah. have them in their life, mm-hmm. and. There are people who maybe like this one guy who just feel the need they have to win, that yeah, they're really yeah. invested. And you yeah. see people, I mean, I'm sure you've had it too, where you play games with people and people just get so mad, whatever yeah. it is. Like, and I'm just wondering, you know what? Like 10 minutes after this game, or two minutes after the game, Man. it's not gonna really mean anything. Like, it, yeah. like whether you won or lost, it's the time we spent together. But people <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think people get it. Like you supposed to have fun together, you know. Back yes. when I was a kid, when I, back when I was a kid, you know, we were kids. You know, you kind of pounce on your victories, right? But like, um, you know, when I was at, uh, like, I got into board gaming because um, some some uh, people donated board games to our YMCA. I mean, our Boys and Girls Club. Okay. And I, I was playing like Stratego, Backgammon, and all these different things. And I, you know, I I just think about those times. Like, all I want to do is play these games with everybody, playing card games growing up. You know, and wins and losses didn't matter because you just played so many games. Like you played so much, you know, right? And, uh, you know, as I got older, I realized when I came back into the hobby, you know, people were more competitive and there are competitions. And I get it. If you put all this work into it, you know, you play Yu-Gi-Oh, you play Magic, you play all these types of games, Power Grid, all that stuff. They have world championships for these things. I get it. But, you know, at game night and things like that. Dog, it's a game, man. This ain't life, bro. Like this, I'm talking about life, man. Like I'm talking about life. Dude, you better move these cardboard and cubes and take these wins and losses and have fun. Have fun with the mechanics. You know, be critical of the mechanics. That's fine. But like the fun is us hanging around each other or me alone figuring out a puzzle and winning or losing. 
and then I move on. I set it back up or I put it in a box and we move on. And we we laugh and we drink regardless of the outcome. Like right. if you can't handle that, and that's that you got different energy, you're not invited at my table. Everybody's invited at my table, even some of my enemies, as long as they can have fun and play a board game. Right. You know and that's, that? that's what, yes. Yeah. And that's exactly what gaming yeah. should be all about. It should right. be having fun yeah. and enjoying the time you're sharing with people, enjoying, because again, board games, when you're sitting around the table, that is the one common denominator. What's sitting yeah. on the table is what's bringing us all together. So we should all like, we sign it up for it. We sign it up. That's what yeah. people don't get it. Like you signed a contract. Like we're here to have fun. Yes. That we are here to have fun. Like, well, you know, it's, it's a competitive game. Okay. That's how you feel. That's great. Try to win. I'm going to try to win too. Uh, I'm gonna make fun of everybody at the table while we're trying to win. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do silly stuff while we're trying to win. Uh -huh. uh, you know, like whatever. But if I win, I win. If I get a moment where I'm close to win, I'm gonna pounce on it. You know, like. But if you lose, I mean, like our game night crew, <laughs> we are we are a wild bunch, man. I, I uh -huh. don't, like. I, we have moments where we ha we have moments where this one guy is an older guy. And we, and we just pick on, we pick on each other. Like every week it seems like we're picking on a specific person. Uh -huh. And uh, Randy, we, Randy, my old guy, Randy, he's great, man. He's great. But man, when he wins, <laughs> he gives it back to us hard. I mean, oh, really? hard. And it's great. It's, it's great. You know, he's uh -huh. a non-confrontational player. He doesn't like to play confrontational games. And then sometimes he just wins them. And he, I mean, he goes, he lets everybody know it. And it's so <laughs> fun. It's fun. Like, we are a fun bunch. Like, that's what right. I want my game group. Like, he's come out of his shell. We've all come out of our shells. And, uh, you know, and we just show our hand. And that goes beyond the table. You start talking about your personal life and things you want to share um, because you guys trust each other. You trust each other to have fun. And, and then you can go beyond that. That's, that becomes a limitless relationship if you, if you make it that way. Yes, no, absolutely. So yeah. um, sort of getting back to like uh, we're with, with gaming and stuff like you're talking about with your group. Where did you start with the Jambalaya Plays Games or why? Mm -hmm. What was your inspiration just to say, hey, I want to start <laughs> That's blogging, wild. podcasting or doing so, whatever? So uh, back in uh, what was it 2015-ish, I started to get back into board games. My, uh, my father-in-law had passed and left us a little bit of scratch. So uh, my wife was like, hey, do what you want to do. Find something you want. You know, get it. Let's just allow some money to get whatever you want. I said, well, I want to start playing board games again, again because some of the, the games I had from when I was a teacher got washed up in a flood back in like 06, 07, something like 09, I think it was. So I was like, let me get some of those board games I had back and then I'll look into some more. And then I got uh, got into it again and I was primarily a solo gamer. Um, just because my friends weren't board gamers. They played they play specific games, but they were old school games that I knew and I kind of played all the time or whatnot. But I was like, you know, I want to try adventure. I want to try these different things. And then I got into these board games, started playing the solo games. The biggest one in the mall, the one behind me up here, Mage Knight, was the one. Um, and uh, it's probably the best and worst game that you'll ever play for a first time coming back in the industry game. But, yeah, it's my favorite game of all time still. But I um, eventually I was like, you know what, I want to go to Gen Con. Gen Con used to be in Milwaukee. It used to be in Milwaukee for 30-plus years. And uh, I did go periodically. So I was like, all right, let me go to let me go to Gen Conison in the um, and I decided to sell my my kit, my whole collection of Kingdom Death Monster, because I didn't want to spend all our I didn't want to spend our money on that. And I sold that for like twelve hundred dollars. And I was like on my way to Gen Con. This is wild. This is just me. This is who I am. I was like, you know what? I want to be a content creator. I want to make content for board games. That's what I'm gonna do. So then I rolled up the Gen Con 50 and I pitched what I was thinking. I had planned out the whole thing. Um, I planned out the whole thing going in. I had kind of planned out like I was gonna really do this. I had sent some emails beforehand, but I, I was kind of like, you know, back and forth, dabbing in and out. And then a couple people helped me cross the finish line uh, mentally. And uh, and then I went and when I got in that car, I was I was dead set on. It. I didn't even have the website up yet. I had nothing up there. I had nothing. But I was just being out there. I could have been like a used car salesman or like a snake oil salesman. But I went in and met with so many people. I showed my hand. I told them this and that and what my desires were uh -huh. uh, for the industry. And like that passion still reigns today. And I shook I shook all their hands last year at um, at Gen Con and just told them thank you. You know they try to hand me games. I'm like man, just thank you, man. Like mm -hmm. I'm here. Like I'm here. Right, right, right. I'm here, and I'm here because of y'all. Like, that's what it's about. 
That's what it's and about. so what was what were what were the uh, early stages like then? Like as far uh, as like like uh, trying to uh, discover yourself or discover mm -hmm. your voice. Mm -hmm. Well, you you have to like. Well, I don't know why I chose script in the beginning because. I'm not the greatest writer, even though I, I do education and I build programs, <laughs> I do a lot of time editing. So I uh, decided to take on this website and the whole I, thing was, is I like to cover small publishers. I like little small card games and, you know, just different things like that. I wasn't in, you know, like in the know of a lot of the games that were out at that time, other than the small ones that were on Kickstarter. Like, I'd be back in these big Kickstarter games. Like at the time, I think it was like Dark Souls, Sword of Sorcery, uh, Folklore, all these things I was backing were big. Cause I like dungeon crawlers and stuff like that. But I also like slick card games, like small ones. Um, like I was working with 25th century games, Colossal on their small card games, you know, like um, just these smaller companies. Um, and that was my passion. You know, uh, my passion was telling the news and informing people. So I kind of branched off from that into working with BGR is doing some promotional stuff. And I would do showcase for publishers and things like that. Um, just showing the games like I didn't care about, you know, like, I don't think anybody cares how I feel. I got this tiny old blog. Let me just share how the game, you know, show how the game plays and be done with it. Um, and I, you know, I just kind of stuck with that. And then after about a year and a half, I was like, well, I want to show some video clips now. Um, I'm tired of taking pictures all day. I'd rather just do a video clip and ex you know, explain what I'm talking about. And then I got to Origins. Then 18, I think it was. And I was just like, all right, let me try this camera thing. And I started interviewing all those people who were kind enough to like listen to me last year. And then um, it just popped off. And, and like several people were like, you just just stay in, on the camera, man. You just stay on the camera. And uh, yeah, that was the day I met Jeremy. And that was the day I met a lot of people that I'm still really close to, really tight with today. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, really tight with today. We drink, we drink merrily together when I see, you know, so. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So then um, now that you're doing this, you know, this is what you do full time, right? Is uh, No, this is definitely not. Not at all. Not oh, at no? All. By day, I am. I work at the Department of Veteran Affairs as a trainer, a training specialist. I help develop employees, um, you know, lower skilled employees all the way up to the director. Oh, I did not know that. Well, see, this, this is why, this is what this is all about. I told you we can go no anywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know we so, can go anywhere. Okay. So, so, uh. Tell us a little bit about then what your life is, your nine to five. What exactly do you do? <laughs> you couldn't tell the way it is right now. It's wow. Um, so by day, I train people. Um, right now, it's completely halted. So I'm not training anybody. So my social media game is high. <laughs> it's high activity right now. Um, but yeah, I train people. I write curriculum. A lot of the stuff that I do is like standard customer service, uh, performance-based interviewing, which is a style of interview that's uh, in the federal government in some spaces. Um, and, and then I also just create training programs um, about like learning. I have a learn at work program, which develops like people who have like high school level, level talent, talents, I should say. Um, and we try to, you know, train them on different things and professionalism and, you know, growth as an individual. And then also just basic skills. Uh, we do that, um, computer training, all these types of things that I can create, um, you know, based upon the director's needs. And also, you know, just department needs and things like that. I teach communication courses and stuff like that that I have to create. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, so that's something else I want to talk about because I know especially since COVID and mm -hmm. people have been out of work or locked in home or, or whatever, a lot of people have gotten in to content creation. Mm -hmm. So how is it um, with you in particular uh, balancing your nine to five mm -hmm your family and also this content creation like how are you able to mm -hmm. do that oh well it's a it's a it's tough you know uh it's, it's really tough um because choices are made and you have to deal with the consequences of all choices whether they're good or bad um well i, I would just say content creation is a grind i probably went too deep into it because we were dealing with that depression so a lot of things were going on inside of the howard howard manor that led us led me to kind of dig maybe too deep into you know the content creating and not too much in my marriage as I should. So I always tell people, you really got to watch it because it is a lot of hard work and you want to put in the extra hours, but you can't forget the perspective of what people are doing. It's the same thing like we're just buying board games or just playing board games all the time. It's like, you got to forget about, you got to like be with people you love, the people who ride for you every day, um, the people you're supposed to be eating with instead of playing a board game and eating next to the board game. You know, um, you know your son and your daughters, you know, um, hell, your cats and dogs, they need you too. <laughs> uh, you know, like everybody needs you in your family. Everybody's needy, you know, 
Um, so you got to really keep that in perspective. But it is a lot of hard work and you have to like you got to schedule. yourself. I did not schedule myself. And it got to a point where my wife was like, you don't schedule yourself. You got you got to stop. You have to stop. I, you, I want you to do what you want to do to be happy. But you got to stop because right. you're just doing it whenever and however and whatnot. And I still struggle with that. But like now I have set days where I dedicate a lot of time to that. Um, you know, and I, I, I put a game right in that. So now it's only two days. So it's like, you know, you got three days a week where you can do stuff and you can't do it all night either. You know, right. Tuesday's the only night where I get to do it like all oh, whatever until, until 1 a.m. I can do whatever I want, you know. So, right. you know, like and that's a good compromise to have. It's not even a compromise. It's just doing what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to stay locked in. You know, the grass still needs to be cut. You know, things need to be moved around. You need to fix the light bulb. It don't take that long. And if it uh-huh. does take that long, then what's really important. Right. You know, so. That's the thing. So it's just I have to you know keep up with that. And I think, you know, even for couples that do it, I'm really glad they do it together. But at the same time, like there's more than board games, even if that's like one of the biggest things that make you happy, like connect with each other, like actually connect with each other, get away from this content, creating editing and all this stuff and try to like still connect away from that table. You know? Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's tough. Yeah, you're right. It is tough because, again, I'm just doing it part time, um, yeah. you know, to fill my time. Right. Because, again, a lot of people started because of this COVID thing, because yeah. out of like they had nothing else to do. So it's like, hey, yeah. let's, let's jump into this and give this a try. So um, I, we already talked about that. You like to do a lot of solo gaming yeah. but outside of solo gaming. What type of gamer would you say you are? I know everybody says, uh, oh, I play all the games. I love all the no, games. No, no. Actually, you know what? The they are lying. They're lying. Um, <laughs> I play literally all the games. I do. I literally play all the games. Uh-huh. Um, because I because I really was doing a lot of promotional stuff, uh-huh. um, a lot of games do come my way. And it's because I, I do give a lot of impressions of my gaming thoughts, and I share a lot of games. Uh, and like I said, I'm on the community a lot. So a lot of these games, you know, I'm trying to share, let people know about them. I feel like I inform people more about games than anything. Uh, but if they share, they won't know my specific thoughts. Trust me, I will let them know. Uh, so uh, and that's why I started to do these podcasts with other people and collaborate with other people. So I can review more games. Uh, but because I've always done just a lot of previews and uh, and then the solo play. So like you'll see the majority of my content is previews. Well, you know, can't really share your compen- opinion on those. Um, those are, you know, basically commercial ads. Um, but, you know, reviews are critical. And I had to find a place where I can do those things. So I started, you know, just going to people visiting. And that's kind of what I do. Like every quarter or so, I start visiting a ton of people and uh, just talking about these games or, you know, topics like this and uh, just letting people know what's up. You know, like uh, I'm glad we're doing this. And we're not all talking about just board games, but how they tie into our lives, you know, um, because there's just more to it and there's more. You know, it's not necessarily about me. You know, you brought me on here to know about me. But, like, I hope people hear some things that connect with them and resonate with them, you know. Oh, no, absolutely. Because, again, you know, like, again, with you, we've talked about how, you know, with mental health issues and about, uh, you know, your life in the military and how, you know, you know, get injured and your change of life. And um, also about having a full time job and doing this. We all have different aspects of us. Of, of, of our lives. But again, what brings us together is the board gaming. And that's yeah. why at the end yeah. of the day, anything we do in board gaming should be joyful, should be happy. You know, and I, I'll tell you right now, like there are times, like I'm serious, like this is crazy. Like I, I listen to this, it's really hurt me right now because a lot of people are really being real grilly about you know, content creators. And we just had a big podcast about that with every night is game night. And I was just like, you know, people often say, you know, like they're worried about content creators taking money from publishers and whatnot. And I was just like, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I make money doing Kickstarter previews. I make good money. MBM makes good money. We make Kickstarter preview videos. We do reviews as well. We do other coverage. Mm-hmm. But at no point is that money enough to pay for my house, <laughs> like my house, my light bills or whatever. And even if it did, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you about a game. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't like, and there's no reason to lie about a board game. Like, right. there's no reason to lie. Like, it's fun. I'm not going to trick you into buying a board game. No publisher said, hey, trick these people into finding a board game. Can you say something positive about my board game? You know, <laughs> they want to know some clarity maybe about what you said. That's about it. And, and they may paraphrase, pra- uh, paraphrase it and mess you up, which is, that's on you. You got to figure out how to clear that up because you don't want anybody misrepresenting you. But like, I'm not going to lie to you. And I generally make sure I try to not cover crappy games. Right, but I, but, I don't understand. but but I but I would say there's an energy that I've been feeling right now. I've been seeing a little groundswell of it right now, and so I have other content creators. And I just tell people like, 
nobody trying to ain't nobody trying to pump fake on you you know like, <laughs> like nobody pump faking on you like we want to inform you right, i want right, to inform right. you i want to inform you i had access to this and you didn't i want to inform you but um, i don't understand yeah. what you said about how people say that you're taking money away from the publishers what, what oh, no, no 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 like what people like say taking money from the publishers like you know somebody's lining my pockets and and like uh, because of that i have this bias where i'm supposed to treat them like with kid gloves and things like that oh i see no, no it's a job you know what i'm saying it's a job you know, and honestly, if you don't like somebody's stuff, they'll be like, well, when you were a younger creator, you know, like you would you would probably say nicer things. I say yes and no. But if I didn't like the game, I wouldn't ask to cover another one of their games. You know what I'm saying? So that like even if it's, you know, just it's a review copy, like if I don't like that game, then I'm not going to ask for any more of their games. You know, like I'll review my games, you know, I'll buy their games. And if I like, I don't like the game they gave me, or it was from a designer, I may not buy their game the next time. So I'm not working with that publisher. I'm not worried about right. that relationship. And if a game comes that I like, and I say, hey, I would like to work with you again on this. I just didn't like the last title. Will you do that? Yes or no? I can deal with that. I could deal with that because you know what I can do? I could go buy my own games. <laughs> you know, yeah. like you know, like it's not like it's not. But the la at the end of the day, for me at least, I'm not gonna try to deceive you. That's silly, man. Like I'm 42 years old. What do I? What do I gain by lying to you? You know, like. Yeah. And that's another yeah. thing that yeah. people who are getting into content creation, that's the mm -hmm. one thing I don't think they realize. You know, because you know, like that that old expression, you know, uh, be careful of what you wish for or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like Tom, you know, from uh, the Dice Tower, what he mm -hmm. always says, he goes, he guarantees. That he plays more bad games than anybody in the world. He does. We do. Yeah. We, we talk about it. We yeah, talk about it. No, we actually talk about. It. We actually talk about. It. We talk about it every Wednesday on a podcast. We have a, a live pod that we do with Lance uh, Meister from. Uh, he works for Gray Fox now, but the Undead Viking, and we have a whole bunch of curmudgeons and stuff like that. Ronald's on there. A couple people. Uh, and we just talk about some of these small things all the time. Like we talked about that catch up game that just came out. <laughs> like he just, oh, yeah, he yeah, just yeah, yeah. lambasted it. It was great. It was like one of the best reviews ever. And, uh, you know, like we play, he, he always says, he's like, Jeremy, you play a lot of games. And I do. And I said, man, there are some stinkers out there. But I will tell people most of the games, and there are a lot of games that come out of here, most of the games we play are okay. They're okay. They're good. Very few are great. And there may be one that's an all timer and that's to be debated over time. You know, like, and I try, I, I try to explain that to people because they're like, well, that game sucks. I'm like, if it's okay to me, it might be a great game to you. So I'm just telling you baseline, like there's fun to be had, but that's where it stops. <laughs> like, and then there's games that are like, man, this game is fun. You know, if this is in your lines and then there's ones that it's like, there's no denying, man, this game is great. You know, right. like, and, and that's why, yeah. You know? And that's why I never wanted to get to the point um, where, like people would send me games like if I'm a, if I'm going to re review games because that's the one thing I don't like where I don't like to me gaming is something I love doing I enjoy yeah. doing I yeah. don't want to spend an hour two three or four out of my life to yeah. do something that I don't like <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it happens it, at, at a certain point like the publishers get you a list and stuff sometimes they just send you stuff in the box with it <laughs> no absolutely <laughs> you're like why'd you send me this but since my friends and I, we drink at game night, sometimes I whip that game out and we play it. Ah. <laughs> and sometimes they're good. So it's like sometimes they're actually fun. And that's the thing. It's like you judge a book by its cover or it's a tiny box and you're used to playing a lot of big Euros. Um, I've always just said games are a lot of opportunity. Every box is opportunity. You never know what you'll find. And then what happens is, is you find a game like Rocky Road Alamode, a game you would never have played. And you're like, man, this game is great. I need to tell people about yeah, this game. Can happen you too. know, it's like, that's the thing. So it's, that, that's the thing. Like, generally, I don't like this. I was, I put Cthulhu Death May Die on there. I'm like, I, nobody can tell me this game is bad. There's no uh -huh. way. It is literally the definition of fun. It's such an easy game. If Even if you hate dice, even if you hate co-ops, there's so many big moments and you're just chucking dice and letting it play out. And I don't know how they figured that out. Like, some, somebody figured that in easy feedback of fun and you won't believe how many people commented on all those posts. And they were like, man, I, don't, I hate co-ops and I love this game. Like, mm -hmm. I love this game. It's so thrilling. I don't even like, I don't like Cthulhu. I, play, I generally try to play co-op games with somebody, but I play that one on my own. Like, it's just, you have so many hoots and hollers yelling. Uh, it comes down to the last moment always. Uh -huh. but it's exciting. Like, that's what you look for. And, and you have to open up your mind. You open up your mind and open up your table to opportunity. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, don't judge well, the book yeah. by its cover. 
Yeah, you know? I guess, it's, I guess and it's hard. It's, it's hard to do that. You know what people usually do that though? They usually do it at conventions, and we've had a lack of conventions. So right. there's a lack. There's a lack of awareness about things, and there's a lack of openness to a lot of things. And I understand that, and also a lack of budget to try things as well. Right. So right. you know, I get all that, man. It's, I get all that. I call that. I'm in a first world situation, and I, you know, I get things, and then I also buy things like crazy, and uh, you know, like I, I'm spoiled that way. You know, I'm fortunate to have a job. You know, uh, yeah. I have a federal job. I'm good. You know, like, you go. I, don't, yeah, absolutely. I ain't got to worry about nothing. So that's why I give. I spend a lot of my time giving as well. So, you yeah. know, I give back to the community a lot, and it's because they supported me. So I support it. All right. So uh, before we go real quick, I just want to go ahead and show people. So right here is this is where people can find you on Twitter, mm -hmm. Instagram, yeah. or any other at Jamba PG. Yeah. What does PG yeah. stand for? Plays uh, games. Uh, Jambalaya plays games. I, I've kept that handle. Um, it says Jumble. It says MB and Man versus Meeple on it. Um, you can also find me on Facebook. Um, I'm generally in all those Facebook groups that are in there, even the industry ones where we just talk about uh, board game topics because uh, I, I ask questions every week um, to them as well. And then, um, yeah, you can find me at a live stream on there. I just live stream from my personal account. I'm not trying to, I don't need to just do MBM labeled right, stuff. Right. Like, I'm just a dude. Like, I am just a dude. And they really are good at letting me be me. And then you know doing my stuff. So even if I had Jumbalaya plays games, they would they would let me, you know be cool with that. Okay, uh, right. It's yeah. not like a big deal. I just decided to really attach them to my you know attach with them. So I am right. part of Man versus Me. Two right. Jeremys can exist okay. together. Yeah, that is right. That is true. <laughs> Two Jeremys. Jeremys okay, so real quick, uh, do me a favor. Just let people know um, maybe what you have coming up, and again, just reiterate where they can find you and all your social mm -hmm. media and stuff. Yeah. So um, things I'm coming up. I'll be visiting a lot of uh, small shows this uh, to end out the year because I like to go out to these smaller YouTube channels and just talk and get them to know and then kind of promote their stuff. But, um, I will be working on a game of the year show. We'll, we'll all be working on a game of the year show for Man versus Meeple, and it's usually a very big show. Um, and we'll probably have we'll have snippets from everybody, so it will be a big show because um, Man Meeple has a decent roster. Um, and I also will be having a live show of my own with uh, Game of the Year for solo games. So that should be really really fun. I'm trying to gather a couple content creators um, that I know are really respectable that have a list as well, and then we can you know collaborate and make a big one. That should be big. I hope it's big on MV and we can do it and pull it off. But yeah. You can always find me on Solo Sundays, which is on Facebook in 2021. It will be on the Man vs. Meeple YouTube site. That'll be Sundays at 3 p.m. Central. So, yeah, that's where you can find me, man. A little bit everywhere. All right. Very good. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us good. today. And I hope, folks, uh, you did have a chance to learn a little bit more about Jeremy. And uh, so, Jeremy, real quick, what do you think is going to be the first convention that kicks off in 21? Gen Con. That's what I was thinking too. Gen Con in August. Well, mm -hmm. if that's the case, I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be joyous. It's going to be a little exciting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. I'll be yeah. right back with you. Well, there you go, folks. As you saw, we got a chance to really get to know a little bit more about Jeremy Howard. Some things I didn't know. He's got a full-time job working for the federal government. Uh, he was a former Marine, and now he's doing a lot of content creation with Man vs. Meeple. So you got the information to go ahead and check him out, as you saw right here, at Jamba PG, and also at Man vs. Meeple on YouTube to get more of Jeremy Howard. Well, thank you again for joining us for another episode of Meepleville.